This contemplation will focus on some of the myths written by J.R.R. Tolkien for his Lord of the Rings fantasy books. I present these, as always, as mere metaphors and allegories for your own contemplation, because, as I've pointed out in another presentation, myth outlines are timeless and always have the ability for truth to shine through even when details are adulterated. I will offer some background to the myths depicted here beforehand, for clarity, so that the contemplation I am trying to convey makes more sense. During the Second Age of Middle-earth, the place where the books are set, a group of elves were deceived by Sauron, who came to them under the guise of a deity known as Anatar, the Lord of Gifts. He then taught them how to make rings of power, by imbuing them with magic. Through his tutelage, these deceived elves crafted rings of power, with most of the rings tainted by touch with a part of Sauron's essence. These rings were then presented as gifts among the several ruling races of Middle-earth, among kings of men, among dwarf kings, and the last, those rings still left untouched by Sauron himself to the elf lords. After his gifts had been spread out among the several kingdoms and realms of Middle-earth, Sauron conceived and crafted himself alone underneath Mount Doom in his uh, dark realm of Mordor, a master ring, a ring that, apart from granting other powers, would control and enslave the wearers of all the other gift rings that he had touched. To be able to accomplish this, however, he was forced to imbue into the Master Ring almost his entire essence, making him vulnerable to only one threat. If the Master Ring was ever destroyed, he would be destroyed with it. Now, after he made the Master Ring, he started to spread his power through the others. The kings of men became so enamored by their new powers that they succumbed easily and became mere wraiths, shadows with no life, under his complete control. The dwarf kings always refused direct control by Sauron, but saw their realms and themselves self-destroyed by their own enhanced greed. And the elf lords did not wear rings that had been touched by Sauron, so they were not as affected but realized that although the control over them could not be directly applied by the Master Ring of Sauron, it could certainly be tried through temptation. One aspect that is also relevant is that the way Sauron controlled the ring wearers was through a voice appearing in their minds. This is for your contemplation. With this background given, one can better understand why in the story Frodo, a hobbit, which is a small humanoid in this myth's setting, was sent through the twists and turns of fate to bring the Master Ring to Mount Dune itself, where it was crafted, to destroy it in its lava furnace, as this was the only fire that could undo it, having been the fire that helped make it. Frodo was sent in the company of several companions, one of them Aragorn, who was the heir to the true crown and throne of Gondor, the largest and most important kingdom of men, and another was Boromir, the eldest son of the steward of Gondor, a lineage of caretakers for the throne, but they were not kings and were merely stand-ins, awaiting the return of a true heir. Another aspect for you to contemplate. Now, the passage I will read next can be found near the end of Book 2 of The Fellowship of the Ring, the first part of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Here goes. Ah, the ring, said Boromir, his eyes lighting. The ring! Is it not a strange fate that we should suffer so much fear and doubt for so small a thing? So small a thing! And I have seen it only for an instant in the house of Elrond. Could I not have a sight of it again? Frodo looked up. His heart was suddenly cold. He caught the strange gleam in Boromir's eyes, yet his face was still kind and friendly. It is best that it should lie hidden, 
he answered. As you wish, I care not, said Boromir. Yet may I not even speak of it? For you seem ever to think only of its power in the hands of the enemy, of its evil uses, not of its good. The world is changing, you say. Minas Tirith will fall if the ring lasts. But why? Certainly if the ring were with the enemy. But why if it were with us? Were you not at the council? answered Frodo. Because we cannot use it, and what is done with it turns to evil. Boromir got up and walked about impatiently. So you go on, he cried. Gandalf, Elrond, all these folk have taught you to say so. For themselves they may be right. These elves and half-elves and wizards, they would come to grief perhaps, yet often I doubt if they are wise and not merely timid. But each to his own kind. True-hearted men, they will not be corrupted. We of Minas Tirith have been staunch through long years of trial. We do not desire the power of wizard lords, only strength to defend ourselves, strength in a just cause. And behold, in our need, chance brings to light the ring of power. It is a gift, I say, a gift to the foes of Mordor. It is mad not to use it, to use the power of the enemy against him. The fearless, the ruthless, these alone will achieve victory. What could not a warrior do in this hour, a great leader? What could not Aragorn do? Or, if he refuses, why not Boromir? The ring would give me power of command. How I would drive the hosts of Mordor, and all men would flock to my banner! In this passage, the eldest son of the steward of Gondor, named Boromir, a brave and strong warrior who had always seemingly been on the side of good, finally gives in to the temptation of both the Ring of Power and of the circumstances around him. His realm of Gondor seems to be fighting a brave but losing battle, as the darkness emerging from Mordor, sent forth by the all-seeing eye Sauron, pushes farther every day regardless of their courageous resistance. To him, at that moment of despair, only one route seems to hold wisdom to take the ring of power and to use it against Sauron. Yet what he does not understand, and Sauron relies on this, is that apart from his consciousness, the ring is Sauron. It is his essence. So it will never ever serve any other master but him. How does this relate to our world and predicament, you may now be asking, after having heard so much? Well, we find many a Boromir in our paths, and we ourselves may act like Boromir at times of pressure. To resolve a seemingly otherwise unsurpassable attack inflicted in our own lives, we are tempted to use the ring, that is, the power and essence of the Shadow Lord of this world. We are tempted because the ring itself speaks to us, it speaks to us exactly because it isn't true and makes us believe that we, being for good, would only ever use it for good. However, the ring's powers were not crafted to be used freely, only to be temptations luring their use, just to trap under the power of darkness anyone who tampers with them long enough. You see, the rings of power represent the system of our world, and so they all fall under the influence of the master ring. In our world today, we find more and more people emotionally asking in despair for the power to defend ourselves and our people against a seemingly insurpassable attack, just like Boromir. And many of us will at least try to reach out and use one of the rings of power, any that we can find, be it the ring of doctors, or that of lawyers, or of bankers, be them alternative or mainstream, or the ring of statesmen, and so on and so forth. To use any of these metaphorical rings is to use the tempting tool laid out to us by the dark tempter, our shadow. To go down that route and be involved with those powers 
would lead to one becoming a tool of the same darkness one was trying to resist. The scripted world we live in is the manifestation of the metaphorical rings, in the sense that these social structures were placed there as gifts from a supposed deity. Just like in the myth, Sauron presented himself as Anatar, a shining deity that came to be known as the Lord of Gifts, offering supposed knowledge, power and technology. In that sense, we live in an opened Pandora's box from the Hellenic myth. For the name Pandora comes from Pan Dorothea, which translates as all the gifts of God. But which God would that be? And what gifts were these, if they all fall under one shadow rule? In the story, the hobbits eventually were able to succeed and destroy the Master Ring, thus destroying not only the Dark Lord himself, but all of his hold over his minions. With that act also went the power of the rings that had been crafted under the tutelage of Sauron. However, they did not simply do it. They relied on small miracles along the way, little twists of fate that allowed them to proceed where otherwise it would have been impossible. Nothing grandiose as we were taught that miracles are supposed to be, but those little coincidences or synchronicities. An empty road when they pass, when usually it was a busy enemy passage. Enemies that argue and fight each other over greed, just as it was most needed for them to pass unnoticed. And even Gollum, one who had been totally enslaved by the Master Ring, biting off Frodo's finger in his fever to repossess his precious ring, only to slip and fall into the furnace. To complete the task, Frodo was unable to finish himself when time came. These miracles were fruits of their moral choice, but also of their trust in that choice, once made. Lots of times they lost heart and even despaired, like Boromir did, but never did they give in. For us to consider using any of this world's metaphorical rings of power in a conflict against the world itself is foolishness, tempting as it may seem. No one who wields a gifted ring, be him doctor or lawyer or banker or statesman or whatever, can use his appointed craft, his appointed power, to win in a battle against the one who gifted him with it. There may seem to be victories here and there, but these are traps to make one believe. The solution to the world's puzzle is not social or political in nature, but moral in essence. When looked at it that way, and going back to the story, when Sauron crafted the Master Ring and poured into it his very essence, in what would be the ultimate move towards his victory, he was actually setting a timer for his own destruction. Yet, that destruction came not from others using his powers against him in despair, but from others trusting the decision not to. <laughs>